The Battle of Wau, if it is known at all, is considered by many to be a mere footnote in the history of the Pacific War, an unknown and unimportant battle in the middle of the deep, isolated Papuan jungle. However, this historical neglect obscures not only an important Allied victory, but one of the Australian Army's great moments of the Second World War. Wau was a desperate engagement, where thousands of young Japanese and Australian men fought each other and the jungle for control of the Bololo Valley, the key to the defence of central New Guinea and the main Japanese bases at Salamaua and Leh. The battle was the last strategically significant Japanese offensive in Papua or New Guinea and marked a key turning point in the Papuan campaign, after which it was the Allies who would be on the offensive. The historical reality is... At WOW, the Australians won a decisive and strategically significant Allied victory, the first of many defeats the 18th Japanese Army would suffer in 1943. In March 1942, whilst the Japanese invasion of the Philippines was still raging, men of the Japanese 144th Infantry Regiment landed at the small village of Salamaua on the north coast of New Guinea. Other detachments occupied the only other settlement in this part of the coast, Lei, to the north. The Japanese quickly began developing these two sites as major bases, with airfields and anchorage facilities. These two bases formed the bedrock of Japan's presence on New Guinea, and were critical elements in her defensive line in the southeast. The only Australian forces in the area were a detachment of the New Guinea Volunteer Rifles, a militia battalion raised from Australian citizens who were living in New Guinea. At Salamaua, their strength amounted to a platoon, or about 30. These men, with an average age of 35, were armed and equipped with weapons and equipment from the Great War, and generally had little formal military training. From March to August, these men waged a low-intensity guerrilla war against the Japanese. Operating from Wau, they laid booby traps on the few tracks leading inland from Salamaua, causing some casualties and maintaining a close watch on the strengthening Japanese forces. In late May, the men of the 2nd 5th Independent Company began arriving at Wau by air. Much like today, in most of Papua there are no roads, only walking tracks, and all reinforcement or supply had to arrive by either air or sea. This made the airstrip at Wau, all the way up the Bololo Valley, the key to the inland area south of Salamaua. The independent companies of the Australian Army were the precursors to the 1st and 2nd Commando Regiments which are operational today. The men of the 5th had recently been through the Australian Army's Special Warfare School in the frigid wilderness of Wilson's Promontory in Victoria. The six-week course, often conducted in the freezing winters with icy cold southern ocean winds, were the toughest infantry course in Australia, and had prepared the men well for the months of jungle existence they would have to endure. Based off the British commandos, the independent companies were staffed by volunteers from the regular army, had a strength of around 270 men, and were designed to operate behind enemy lines to conduct reconnaissance, sabotage, raiding, and ambush. With the arrival of the 5th Company, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Flair, Kanga Force was established. Kanga Force's orders were to hold the airfields in the Bololo Valley and harass the Japanese forces in the area. In the following months, numerous small engagements were fought, including one which killed the commanding officer of the Mubo Detachment. The Australians' training in sabotage was put to great use during this period, as a favourite tactic was the laying of mines and booby traps along the very few tracks that linked the villages. However, with the strength of the Japanese forces in the area, there was little more that could be done. The most successful action was the raid on Salamaua on the 28th of June. Captain Norman Whitting, the commander of the New Guinea Volunteers, had elements overseeing the Japanese position at Salamaua for weeks. He began to plan a night raid with the objective of destroying the wireless station, a bridge, and killing as many of the enemy as possible. At 3.15am, seven sections of the 5th Commandos, each around 10 men strong, entered the area from different positions, catching the sleeping Japanese unaware. Lieutenant Tom Leager recalled the attack on a satellite village of Keller. We jumped over the seawall and raced across the road, shooting two sentries who just stood dumbfounded. We hurled sticky tank grenades reinforced with a kilo of gunpowder in through the windows and doors of buildings. The blast was so severe it blew us over like nine pins. We charged through the doors, shooting and bayoneting anything that moved. We picked up some enemy weapons before we pulled out. All told, the Australians killed 115 men and achieved all of their objectives, 
destroying six houses, three trucks and the bridge. Critically, a number of documents were recovered that indicated Japanese plans to attack Milne Bay. All of this was achieved with only three men lightly wounded. After the success of the Salamaua raid, the Japanese began aggressive patrolling across the mountains towards Mubo, with the objective of containing the Australians. However, with both sides heavily committed in the Kokoda track campaign, neither wanted to divert large-scale reinforcers to the Salamaua or Ley area. This situation, however, began to rapidly change in December 1942. With the defence of the strategically vital Gona Buna area now deemed to be hopeless, the 18th Army Area Command decided that the Salamaua and Ley bases had to be substantially reinforced. The current garrison of around 1,200 men would not be sufficient if the Gona Buna front collapsed. On the 29th of December, the 18th Area Army Commander, Lieutenant General Adachi, ordered the Akabe Detachment, a reinforced regimental group from the veteran 51st Division, which had seen extensive action around Shanghai, to deploy from Rabaul to Lei. Major General Okabe's orders were to move against Wau immediately and secure the airfield. Okabe detachment numbered around 3,000 men, centred on the 102nd Infantry Regiment, with supporting elements. The formation left the primary Japanese base at Rabaul on the 5th of January, 1943. Allied command had been expecting such a move, as reconnaissance had detected a huge concentration of shipping at Rabaul, some 91 vessels, including 21 warships. An RAAF Catalina of No. 11 Squadron detected the convoy carrying Okabe Detachment, sinking one ship in a night raid. Over the next two days, several RAAF and U.S. Army Air Corps squadrons attacked the convoy with limited success, and a force of over 4,000 men and large amounts of supplies were effectively landed at Ley. With this intelligence, General Thomas Blamey, the Southwest Pacific Area Land Commander and the man effectively in command of all land operations in New Guinea, began to react. It was clear that this formation now posed a real threat to Kanga Force around Wau, which, although had been reinforced with another independent company, was in no way strong enough to hold the valley in the face of Okabe Detachment. However, Blamey had specifically held the veteran 17th Brigade in reserve around Milne Bay. Blamey described his dispositions in a letter to Edmund Herring, the commander of 1st Corps. Whether the intention of this force is to push forward from the Ley and Salamaua area towards Wau remains to be seen. This event has always been present in my mind, and I have kept the 17th Brigade, AIF, intact to either meet this threat or as the spearhead of an advance in this area. Brigadier Moton, the CO of the 17th Brigade, was given orders on the 9th of January that he was to take command of Kanga Force on the 15th, with the aim of moving his brigade there as quickly as possible. Okabe landed with the 102nd Regiment at Ley. In addition to the 102nd, Okabe had the 2nd Battalion, 14th Field Artillery Regiment, 3rd Company, 51st Engineer Regiment, 3rd Company, 51st Transport Regiment, Anti-Aircraft, Mortar, Signals, Medical and Labour Detachments, and 144th Regiment Reinforcements. He had two possible axes of advance towards Wau. The first was up the Markham River and along the Below Low Valley, which was by far the easiest, but would leave his forces with little cover from air attack. The second option was to ferry his forces down the coast to Salamaua, and then cross the treacherous Cooper Mountain Range along the Black Cat Track through Mubo. Although this second route was much shorter, around 45 kilometers compared to 110, it was much more difficult. The Cooper Mountains rise over 2,000 meters above Salamaua, and the Black Cat track is as difficult in places as its much more infamous cousin, Kokoda. There was no possibility of moving artillery via this route. Okabe decided to advance through Salamaua, primarily because of the potential vulnerability to air attack. Although the Allied air support for the WOW campaign was actually not overwhelming, Okabe's experience in his transit from Rabaul certainly underscored this danger. By the 16th of January, all of Okabe detachment had been ferried down the coast of Salamaua and were prepared to begin their advance over the Cooper Range. The race to Wau had begun. On the 13th, whilst the Japanese were moving their forces down the coast by sea, the Australians were moving the 17th Brigade by air. However, air transport in New Guinea was extremely hazardous. Not only were the transport aircraft in short supply, but the weather was extremely challenging. January is the rainy season in New Guinea, and low cloud would often make landing at Wau impossible. 
For four consecutive days, no flights were able to land. However, by the 19th of January, Moton had moved the majority of the 6th Battalion into Wau, some 535 men, and had begun deploying its companies in defence. He ordered a rifle company to advance up the Boosval track and to take defensive positions, and two platoons to move up the track to the Black Cat Mine. The first contact was made with the Japanese on the 20th. A patrol noted large Japanese concentrations along the Black Cat track, although they had not made contact at the mine. By the 24th, Australian patrols had discovered what was happening. The Japanese had used a derelict old track, called the Jap Track by the men, to bypass the Australian positions and were advancing on wow and strength. With this course of events, Moten saw an opportunity for a counterattack. The Japanese were now between his two formations on the Black Cat and Busabal tracks, and were apparently right for a flank attack launched from the Black Cat mine. With further reinforcements arriving in Wow by the day, including the lead elements of the 5th Battalion, Moton felt secure enough to commit the whole 6th Battalion to the attack. By the 27th, the attack elements were in place, and the assault was set to begin on the morning of the 28th. However, the Japanese were faster. At 4am, just as A Company was getting ready to move up the Jap track from its defensive positions, they were hit with a ferocious attack. Supported by mortar and machine gun fire, the Japanese mounted mass frontal assaults on the Australian position at the village of Wandumi. However, these were relatively easily broken up by cool and accurate rifle fire and the company's Vickers guns. At 2.30pm, the Japanese changed their tactics. Rather than massed infantry charges, they began to infiltrate the Australian lines by crawling through the tall grass. Soon the right flank platoon had Japanese infantry between its fighting positions, causing great disorder and killing several men. The entire company's position was in grave danger of being outflanked when the company commander, Sherlock, led all the reserve he had with him, basically his HQ section and a couple of commandos, in a bayonet charge. The audacity of this attack restored the situation, as the sight of the Australians charging through the tall grass behind their bayonets proved too much for the Japanese, who broke in retreat. By 6pm, the company was still holding firm, however they were running desperately short of ammunition. With reports of hundreds of Japanese moving down the track, Moton gave the order for Sherlock to withdraw. With the 6th Battalion Centre, A Company, now firmly retreating, the other elements up the Black Cat Trail were in danger of being cut off and retreated back to Wow. The men of A Company had inflicted 75 casualties. The Japanese advance had been slower than expected. It had taken almost two weeks to move from Salamaua to the mountains overlooking Wow. On the 27th of January, the force had reached Hill 500, where Okabe could see the airstrip in the valley below, a distance that only looked to be a few miles away. He immediately gave the order for the 102nd Regiment to advance with all possible speed, hoping to maintain the element of surprise. The regiment advanced with two battalion groups, which were intended to execute a pincer attack on the airfield. The attack on Wow was scheduled to begin on the 28th at dawn. However, by the end of the 27th, the lead elements were still in the hills, and the whole day of the 28th was spent trying to dislodge A Company around Wandumi, an action that had cost Okabe a large number of killed and wounded. Okabe ordered his men to advance at night with the aim of lessening the air threat, but this slowed down the advance substantially. Even after the night of the 29th, the 2nd Battalion in the south was still 2.5 miles from the airfield. The situation during the 28th and the 29th was critical for the Australians. Moton had no reserve left at Wow, and the airfield was defended by scratch elements of cooks and staff. He had ordered two companies to withdraw from positions farther up the valley to reinforce the airstrip, but these were lucky to make it past the advancing Japanese forces. Fully half of the 17th Brigade was waiting on the airstrips at Port Moresby to be moved, but the weather would simply not cooperate. Three times on the 29th, aircraft took off from Port Moresby, but were turned back due to low clouds over Wow. It was only Sherlock's stubborn defence that bought the Australians enough time to have a chance at winning the battle. By the morning of the 29th of January, the Japanese forces were within rifle range of the airstrip, and mortars began falling on the Australian positions. However, Moton looked up to see a beautiful blue sky. Finally, the weather had cleared, and the Australians did not waste the opportunity. The American pilots of the 374th Troop Carrier Group braved enemy fire and treacherous mountain passes to reinforce Moton, and that day a record 60 plane loads were delivered to Wow.
The 24-hour delay had allowed the remainder of the 5th Battalion and the whole 7th Battalion, some 814 men, to reinforce the airstrip, right as the Japanese were preparing to launch their attack. Moten now had about two battalions around the airstrip, which he deployed in a tight defensive line, although he pushed a rifle company forward along the road towards the Japanese. By the morning of the 30th of January, 1943, Okabe was ready to make the assault on the airfield. The 102nd had two battalions, each reinforced to make the attack on the Australians. On the Japanese left flank, the 1st Battalion would advance along the main road that runs southeast of the Wau airstrip. Along this position, Moten had deployed A Company of the 7th Battalion under Captain Walker forward of the main defences at a small farm about a mile from the airfield. Behind Walker's company, Moten had deployed another rifle company under Captain Rowan, which had dug in on good defensive ground just south of the road. Both of these formations were placed forward of the main defensive line on the airfield itself, which gave the Australian defences a substantial amount of depth on this flank. To the north, Okabe deployed the 2nd Battalion of the 102nd Regiment, which had orders to move to the right flank, up the Bololo River, and then advanced through the jungle and attacked the airfield from the northeast. Here the Australians had no forward deployed forces, and the first defences were around the coffee plantation on the edge of Wau itself. This section was manned by the men of B Company, the 7th Battalion, and the commandos of the 5th Independent Company. In total, Okabe probably outnumbered the Australians by about 3 to 2, but the task had grown much more formidable than the day before. Before dawn, the attack in the south began. The men of the 1st Battalion launched an assault on the most forward Australian position, Walker's company at the farmstead. Several hundred Japanese assaulted the Australians in a massed battalion attack. Walker's front was formed by three platoons, and the ferocious assault forced the centre and right platoon to retreat to the Australian formations farther back, although the left platoon held its position. Walker retreated to Rowan's company, which was dug into the south of the main road. Major General Okabe led the 2nd Battalion in this attack personally, and as they pursued the retreating Australians past the farm and along the road towards Wau, the Japanese found themselves in a disastrous tactical situation. As the Japanese column advanced down the road, they made contact with C Company of the 7th Battalion, which was in good defensive positions to their front. As the Australians to their front opened fire on them with cool, disciplined rifle and bread gun fire, a torrent of machine gun fire poured in from their left flank. Okabe had advanced past the men of Rowan's company who were dug into the south of the road, and which were now in a perfect flanking position. Vickers' machine gun fire tore into the advancing Japanese column, shredding their ranks and causing great confusion. With the eruption of battle, the platoon which had remained at the farmstead opened fire into the Japanese rear, and the whole battalion group broke into headlong retreat to the east, leaving hundreds of dead and dying men. The devastating impact of the flank ambush of Rowan's A Company of the 5th Battalion was typical of many encounters between Japanese and Australian forces. When operating under heavy jungle cover, the Japanese were masters of rapid manoeuvre, often outflanking Australian defensive positions in engagements in Malaya and along the Kokoda Track. They were also ferociously dogged defenders, and were always extremely difficult to engage when they had fixed fighting positions. But, typically, when the Australians were able to engage the Japanese in open terrain, they were able to impose devastating casualties. The Australian Army had honed its doctrine and weapons in over four years of combat in the trenches of the Western Front, and were very adept at placing their medium machine guns, of which there were many, in firing positions which amplified their effect. Firepower, particularly the use of automatic weapons, was a key Australian advantage when engaging the Japanese. This is evident in numerous actions during the New Guinea campaign, including the defence of the No. 3 airstrip at Milne Bay. After dawn, on the Japanese right flank, the 1st Battalion began its assault on Wau. They advanced to the northeast corner of the airfield, through the jungle, and approached the main Australian defensive positions in a coffee plantation. Here, the Japanese executed a battalion attack on the commandos of the 5th Independent Company, which held this corner of the airfield. As was typical of Japanese massed assaults, this attack was extremely fierce and conducted with the utmost bravery. As the massed Japanese companies ran through the coffee plantation, the men of the commandos opened up on them with a devastating weight of fire. Again, 
the Australian Vickers guns, in place to cover this area in a crossfire, cut swaths through the advancing Japanese infantry. Despite these losses, the Japanese pressed home their attack and succeeded in taking some of the advanced defensive positions. At this time, however, B Company began moving through the coffee plantation from the extreme Australian left wing. It had been ordered to move up to support the fighting in the southeast along the road when the Japanese 1st Battalion made its attack against the commandos right to their front. As they swept through the coffee plantation, the Japanese were, again, enveloped. With frightful losses and Australians now threatening their right wing, the men of the 1st Battalion were forced to retreat, pulling back towards the Bololo River. The attack had been a disaster for the Japanese. Australian casualties had been light, and Okabe estimated that the average Japanese company strength was 50 men in the 1st Battalion and 40 men in the 2nd. The open fields around Wow were now littered with hundreds of dead and dying Japanese men. By 10am, Walker's company was able to advance to his original positions around the farm and reform his unit, occupying the foxholes he left before dawn with only limited resistance. The Japanese were now in positions between Wau and the Bololo River, and were trying to reform and regroup after the morning's fighting. Mota knew this was a perfect time for a counterattack. With the lull in the fighting, more reinforcements were able to be brought in. Critically, two 25-pounder artillery pieces were able to be landed, along with over 600 rounds of ammunition. These guns had to be flown in pieces, and as the men were assembling them on the airfield, rifle fire was still landing around them. The American Dakota pilots showed great courage keeping WOW supplied with reinforcements and supplies, as machine gun and rifle rounds hit the ground around their aircraft as they unloaded. Without their commitment, the Australian position at WOW would have been untenable. At 2pm, the battalion commanders were given the order to advance. Moton decided that the high ground on the Australian right flank was the key to the battlefield. In the south, C Company of the 7th Battalion was ordered to take the high ground to the south of the Australian position, which dominated the positions Okabe had used to attack in the morning. By 4 o'clock, the Australian company was on the ridgeline. However, there were still unseen Japanese fighting positions along the ridge to their south. Walker's A Company moved to the south of the road on C Company's left, climbing a small ridge. At the crest, they saw a column of around 400 Japanese infantry advancing along the road. The enemy did not see the Australians until they were only 200 metres away, when Walker opened up a devastating torrent of fire. The newly arrived artillery had an immediate impact. Captain Wise, in command of the 25-pounders, wrote of the encounter. Approximately 400 Japs advanced in a column of lumps along the road right in front of me, and I had a field day with them. At nightfall of the 30th, the Australians were in a very strong position. Not only was the airfield now very strongly held, but Moton had established three companies on the high ground to the south of the main Japanese axis of attack. From these positions, he threatened Okabe's communications to Selamawa. Evidently, both sides used the following two days to rest and regroup, as the positions did not change appreciably. The Australians used the weather to fly in more reinforcements, this time two composite companies from the redundant Bren carrier platoons. Moton used these forces to hold the airfield, which allowed him to utilize the rest of his brigade for offensive operations, and sent out several patrols to maintain contact with the Japanese. By the 1st of February, the strength of Kanga Force had risen to 2,965 men, giving the Australians numerical superiority for the first time in the battle. With the clearing weather, the Australians were now able to rely more heavily on air support. RAAF A-20 Boston bombers were able to begin striking Japanese rear areas around the Black Cat Track. The fighting over the next two days revolved around the possession of the high ground to the southeast of Wau. On the 3rd of February, C Company of the 7th Battalion launched a surprise morning attack to the south of the main Japanese positions, taking a high point called the Bear Knoll. By 10 o'clock, they were well dug in on its summit. From this position, the Australians began to dominate the valley and could see the main Japanese supply line running through the Jap track. In the north, the commandos of the 3rd Independent Company with artillery and mortar support, began advancing towards the Bololo River to the area where the Japanese attack on the airfield had been staged on the 30th. They ran into fierce resistance around the small village of Kops, taking fire from an estimated two medium machine guns and seven light machine guns. Several of the commandos were killed, including Lance Corporal Georges, who, despite a severe chest wound, leapt into a Japanese machine gun position 
killing the gunners and then turning the Nambu LMG on the Japanese. The attack stalled on the 3rd, but now the Australians had a clear picture of the enemy positions. On the 4th, the commandos executed a textbook attack, supported by a creeping artillery and mortar barrage, taking each enemy fighting position in turn. By evening, they had taken the village and driven the Japanese across the river. With the Australian gains on the high ground to the south and along the Blue Low River to the north, it was clear to Okabe by the 4th of February that the Japanese position was untenable. Not only were the Australians gaining in strength, there was now a very dangerous possibility that his remaining forces would be surrounded. The commandos, now in possession of cops, began sending patrols down the river, threatening the rear of the Japanese 2nd Battalion. From the heights of the Bear Knoll, the Australians were now directing accurate artillery fire on his men. On the 6th of February, with no other option available, and the Australians now in control of all of the 1st Battalion's prior positions, Okabe gave the order that all of his forces were to retreat back towards the village of Wandumi, so his forces could regroup. However, the Australians kept up the pressure. The Japanese rearguard forces were hammered with successive attacks, and by the 9th they had retaken Wandumi, which they had lost on the 28th. Now in full-blown retreat, the Japanese forces were in danger of being routed. Most of the men had exhausted their rations much earlier in the battle, and were now living on wild potatoes. They were sick with dysentery or malaria, and a large number were wounded. They headed back up the mountains towards Salamaua, a torturous 45 kilometer march through some of the most inhospitable jungle terrain New Guinea has to offer. The Australian independent companies pursued them up the Jap track and other units were already operating on the flanks of the Japanese forces around the Black Cat Mine. On the 13th of February, Lieutenant General Adachi ordered Okabe to abandon the attempt to capture Wau and withdraw back to Salamaua. Of the approximately 3,000 men that had left Salamaua for the Wau offensive, less than 2,200 arrived back on the 23rd of February. Of these men, which included a large contingent of walking wounded, none were considered combat worthy. Okabe Force, fully a third of the veteran 51st Division, was now worthless as a combat formation. By the 15th of February, Motel ordered his infantry battalions to report back to Wau. In the surrounding fields and hillsides, the Australians counted 753 dead Japanese, and modern estimates place their total losses at 1,200. Kanga Force, from its creation in early 1942, had lost 30 officers and 319 men. The Australians were now firmly established in the Blolo Valley, and substantially greater forces would be required to dislodge them. From the Wau and Blolo airfields, the Allies maintained a foothold on the north coast of New Guinea, which constantly posed a landward threat to the major Japanese bases in the area, Salamaua and Leh. The Australian victory at Wau was the result of excellent leadership at the brigade and battalion level, and the high morale of the individual fighting men. The Japanese plan of attack was sound, but poorly executed, and through the highly skilled placement and movement of infantry forces throughout the battle, the Australians were able to exploit this weakness. Indeed, the advantage in firepower was particularly telling. Wow was a decisive Allied victory, and the Australians now had truly ended Japanese offensive aspirations in the Southwest Pacific. 1943 would be a year of Allied advance and Japanese retreat. After the defeat to Kokoda, Gona Buna, Milne Bay, Guadalcanal, and Wow, the Japanese decided to deploy the majority of their land forces in defence, landing the 51st, 20th, and 41st Divisions on the New Guinea coast from Ley to Wewak. It would be to these forces of the 18th Japanese Army that Blamey and MacArthur would turn their attention next in the Salamaua and Leh campaign. By the end of 1943, Japan's presence on New Guinea would be all but gone.